Let's spend a little bit of time learning about emotion, right? It's going to be exciting. All right, uh, what are we going to talk about? Basically, we're going to talk about fear and aggression. Those are, are sort of two of the most important emotions, right? You should always run around looking fearful and aggressive at the same time. It's a, it's a great way to live your life, I promise. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about impulse control. Anybody have trouble with impulse control? No, nope. some people do. Yeah, hands usually go up pretty quickly right there. So should have controlled that. Uh, <laughs> emotions are great, right? Uh, and, and so you think about, well, what's like the utility of emotions? Well, yeah, I, I, I don't know, whatever. Uh, but what's really important is if you have an emotion, being able to communicate that, right? If you are angry or happy or sad or, or whatever, uh, you need to be able to convey that to someone else effectively, or it's, it's sort of a waste of your time having that emotion, right? And so we're going to talk about that through uh, facial expressions most today. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about feelings of emotion, and so that is really something important. Feelings are not the same as emotions. I know a lot of folks try to use those words interchangeably. Right? And that's probably fine if you're just like walking the street yelling out about your feelings and emotions. Uh, Kiwi people love it when you do that. So it's a fast way to clear the street. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that. Like, if you ever need to like get through a line quickly, just start screaming <coughs> about your feelings and your emotions. It's the fastest you'll ever get through the line of Bojangles, uh, I promise. So, uh, feelings are different than emotions. Uh, it's, it's your sort of internal perception of those emotions, right? And so we'll, we'll talk about that as well. All right, so first, there's no such thing as a neutral emotion, right? Somebody asks you what's your emotion neutral. Uh, Casey, if somebody says that and they mean it, that's pathological, right? Sure, you're just gonna go for sure. Uh, an emotion is a positive or a negative reaction to a particular situation. There is a physiological change, right? Accompanying that behavior. Uh, or at least the urge to perform that behavior, right? That's what we want to think about. Urges kind of count in this, right? How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, have ever, you know, wanted to just like strangle someone? Yeah, they've irritated you so much, right? It happens. Hopefully you didn't do that, right? Uh, maybe a few of you have, it happens, uh, even to the best of us. But uh, what we want to think about are those physiological changes that occur up to that behavior or that might have led to that particular behavior, right? If you think about a lot of emotions, uh, we have elevated heart rate, we have changes in blood pressure. Uh, how many of you ever start sweating when you're nervous? Again, you don't have to raise your hands. So maybe that's a private question, right? Uh, so you don't have to answer that. So those are physiological changes, though. This is why, uh, and again, one more question you don't have to answer. Uh, how many of you have ever had a polygraph? I mean, we'll know if you have because we can tell. Uh, but if you've ever had a polygraph, one of the things they measure is uh, skin conductance, right? When people get stressed, when people get a little nervous, they start to uh, like kind of micro sweat, right? And so there's a little bit of sweat that comes out on their skin, changes the uh, electrical conductance of your skin. We can measure that. How many of you remember, I'm gonna draw a picture. Of a guy. Yeah, I'm sure you guys remember this. <coughs> Remember the frog shocker, Luigi Galvani? See, that looks exactly like him, doesn't it, Mary? Uh, I did a good job drawing that. Uh, he was the guy who, who shocked the frogs and was like, yeah, muscles run on electrical signals, right? That's cool. Uh, the Galvanic skin response is, is named after him, right? Apparently, he also, also used to go around shocking liars. I don't know. It's a hobby of his. Like, oh, it works when I shock a frog. What about this guy? I think that's lying to me. Let me see. Hey, who remembers that whole conversation we had, of course, now it's been two weeks ago, uh, about hormones? Yeah, we're going to talk about hormones again, right? Because hormones are pretty important. Uh, they're, they're very influential on our behavior. A lot of those are coming out of the adrenal medulla. I like to call this the elf hat on your kidney, right? So everybody's got a couple kidneys. And stuff's coming in and out. On top of that kidney... Uh, you've got your adrenal gland that's going to dump out a bunch of hormones. That's why we call it an adrenaline rush. Most of the time, uh, these hormones, especially the ones coming out of the 
adrenal medulla, uh, they're going to increase blood flow to muscles. That's going to be awesome. Um, if you need to get away from something, you know, some of the biggest sort of responses to emotional situations, you think about fight or flight, right? And if you're going to do either one of those, you're really going to need to get uh, blood flow to your muscles. You're going to also need to liberate some nutrients to those muscles because you're going to need to make some glucose so those guys can continue to do their job while you're running away from, you know, I don't know, a lion or, a, you know, whatever the situation is. Does that make sense to everybody? Hormones, again, they're sort of long-lasting, right? This is why even after you have been out of that stressful situation, you'll still feel, uh, <clears throat> you'll still feel the effects of that hormone, right? So you're still going to be a little bit, uh, you know, have an elevated uh, heart rate, your blood pressure is going to be up, you're still going to be a little shaky maybe, right? Even after the threat has disappeared because you've got to wait all those hormones to wash out, right? It's not as fast as your, your nervous system. Uh, your brain's already sending you signals like, look, the lion's gone, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but your hormones are still there, having their effect on the rest of your body. All right, so let's spend a little time talking about fear. This is a very important emotion. That helped. Helped me, I can kind of hide back here now. In the dark. So, uh, fear is an important emotion. How many of you are afraid of things? All right, let's write down what those are, Casey. Ask everyone what their biggest fears are. All right, you ready? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, some people are afraid of things that make a lot of sense, right? How many of you are afraid of heights? Yeah, that's reasonable, right? Uh, most people are, are in between that like four and seven feet tall range, right? And if you're anywhere uh, above that, you can fall. Things can happen like broken legs, embarrassment, <laughs> all things you should be afraid of. Uh, some people are afraid of ridiculous things, right? Uh, some people have ridiculous fears. You guys remember that, what was his name, Little Albert? And they threw the rabbit at his face and it clawed him. I don't think that's exactly how it went, but... Um, Close enough, right? And that little kid was afraid of rabbits. You know, I, I don't know. That's kind of ridiculous, right? I mean, anybody else afraid of rabbits? No. How many of you are afraid of snakes? Nobody's afraid of snakes. Everybody's afraid of snakes. Go ahead and be honest, right, Keely? Everybody's afraid of snakes. That's reasonable for most people. Uh, I mean, at least it used to be reasonable. Uh, maybe it's not so reasonable anymore. So, But we can have a fun conversation about, we'll have a conversation about snakes later and teddy bears, it's going to be fun, and conveyor belts. I know, it's getting thrilling, right? It's like a bad James Bond movie. You put a teddy bear on a conveyor belt, dump it into a pit of snakes. All right, so you've got this guy called the amygdala. It's uh, Latin for the word almond, right? Uh, there are actually sort of three parts to the amygdala the lateral, the central, and the basal portion. There's also some stuff you'll read, because uh, I know somebody's going to get super excited about this. I'm going to read about the amygdala. There's also like this extended amygdala business. I'm not going to expect you to think about that too much, okay? But your amygdala is really your uh, sort of fear center, right? It is the brain region that's going to process all of those fear emotions. Okay? It's going to receive a ton of inputs from just about everywhere and it's going to send a bunch of outputs to sort of the important places, we'll see that in a moment, uh, where you might think there, uh, you know, that might be important if you're having a, a sort of a fear reaction, right? If you don't have an amygdala, guess what happens? You don't really experience fear, right? Which is kind of interesting. All right, so here we go. Here's your amygdala, kind of located down here in your brain. Not a big deal. We are getting a bunch of inputs as we said, stuff's coming from your cortex, your thalamus, that's your sensory, sensory information, your hippocampus. We haven't talked about learning and memory yet, but your hippocampus is involved in learning and memory. It's also involved in some spatial organization, right? figuring out where you are in space. Both of those things kind of seem important if you're going to have a fear response. We're going to send information out eventually to several places. Uh, we're going to send things out to uh, parts of the thalamus which will eventually get stuff to the prefrontal cortex. It's this guy up here. We said that prefrontal cortex is really important for like planning, right? 
Okay. We're also going to talk in a few moments. There's a guy up here in the prefrontal cortex that's going to be involved in impulse control. So that's going to be important, right? If you have a fear response, um, how many of you are afraid of something, but it's something stupid, and you're with your friends, and that thing like appears, but you're not going to you're not going to be the person, you know, it's like afraid of dogs. That's ridiculous. This little poodle comes at you, right? And friends are going to laugh at you. Uh, so what do you do? You kind of control that, right? You can kind of kind of hold that down for a few minutes. The other place where we have an output is the uh, hypothalamus. Why would we send something to the hypothalamus? Again, that guy's responsible for hormones, right? And if we need to get some hormones going so that we can increase blood flow, we can liberate those nutrients, we really need to get the hypothalamus involved as quickly as possible in this particular uh, fear circuit, right? <clears throat> All right, so, uh, here is a whole list of a ton of places where the amygdala sends information. Right? I'm not going to expect you to memorize this entire list. Okay? But if you think about this for a few moments, and you start to think about some of the places that we're targeting, like for example, the locus ceruleus, which we said uh, before, controlled uh, like acetylcholine release, right? Uh, because it increases uh, Vigilance, right? And norepinephrine is in there as well. Uh, if you think about some of these other places, here's the, uh, you know, trigeminal nerve, we're going to think about facial expressions, okay? So if we're going to make a facial expression of fear, we need to send a signal there as well, okay? So all of these really seem to, seem to make some sense. Here's the area that controls uh, increased respiration, right? So the amygdala is going to target all of these places to sort of get that fear response up and running, right? So that you can be ready to respond as needed. Again, typically in that flight or fight sort of situation. All right, so how do we know uh, things about fear, right? And fear responses. Well, there are a few things that we can do. We can study people, and we'll talk about some of that stuff later. Uh, but you can also study animals, right? Uh, you can go around, you can make animals afraid of things, right? How many of you have a dog? How many of you have trained that dog to do something, right? Okay. Yeah, so you've either trained that dog to either be afraid or to kind of look forward to a particular reward, reward based on their behavior, right? I mean, if you have one of those like red uh, pet corrector cans, is that what they're called? Like you spray it and it makes this like loud hissing noise. No, nobody has one of those. I use it on the neighborhood kids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it works just as well. Uh, you just run out and I can't. I don't know if it's the can or if it's me running it that makes them leave. But either way, uh, they, they, they stay away from my house now. Which explains why I had this like entire bowl of Halloween candy left over in October. That's the way it goes. But we can do something, uh, we create something called the condition emotional response, right? And without going too much in depth to tell you about learning and memory processes, which we're going to talk about in a few weeks, right? Uh, what we basically do here is we take a rat and we flash a light, for example, and every time we flash that light, we give that rat just a little bit of a shock, right? And I don't know if any of you have ever been shocked. It's, it's not the most pleasant thing, right? Even if it's just like static electricity. Uh, so we'll shock that rat just a little bit, and then we'll continue to do that, let's say 20, 30, 40 times, whatever. Eventually, we can get to the point where we can flash the light, and even if we don't shock the rat, the rat will have a response like it's going to be shocked, right? It's going to be prepared for it. It's going to have that sort of like, I know what's coming next, right? Okay. So it's going to prepare for that. And a lot of you probably do the same thing, right? Uh, we just sort of got out of the winter months of so static electricity is going downhill now, so that's great, right? Uh, welcome, welcome humidity. Uh, so I don't know if you like static electricity or if you like humidity, you got to pick. You get one or the other. Uh, how many of you have like a doorknob at your house? That would always kind of shock you, right? Every time you would grab for it. And, and what do you do, Scotty? You kind of, right? Because you know what's coming, right? Doorknob, I know, I've learned I'm going to get shocked, right? And so you can kind of pick up on it. Uh, this happens a lot with older brothers. I don't know if any of you have an older brother, right? Or are an older brother, right? Uh, what's the number one thing older brothers do? Rib punches, right? It's right at the top of the list. As uh, soon as you get a younger sibling, they give you this book. 
just says rib punch on every on every page. <laughs> uh, and so what do you do to your younger siblings? You punch them in the ribs every time you can, right? It's just what you do. Uh, if you guys have been failing on that, it's time to catch up, right? Uh, so uh, what do you do when you see your older brother? When you probably start to tense up a little bit at some point, right? Because you know something's coming. It may not be a rib punch. There are variations, right? Uh, there's the wedgie, uh, uh, there are other things, you know, kind of depends, uh, you know, some folks get creative. Uh, but at a certain point, hopefully, uh, right, your older brother matures to the point where he, he's no longer punching you in the ribs, right? And then when you see him, what do you do? You can kind of relax a little bit, right? So that's kind of cool. So there you go. That's classical conditioning and extinction all in one story. Casey, do you have older or younger siblings? Oh, really? Are they a whole lot older than you? Because there's like a there's like a gap where if they're like so much older than you, then you you miss out on the rib punching. And, and I'm sorry if that happened. Some are, some are not. Oh. I have a brother three years older than me, and there was rib punching. Yep. No, that's that's right within that window. Yep. Right within that. Window. <clears throat> All right. So. That's going to be a classically conditioned fear response, not a big deal, right? There we go, we've got a rat, we shock it, we give it a signal, ring a bell, shock it, ring a bell, it gets scared, right? That's the way it works. Now, in terms of humans, well, what we do know is if we, with these guys, if we were to this is how I'm drawing a, an amygdala lesion. If we were to lesion their amygdala, what we would see is that these animals are no longer able to learn that association, right? They're no longer able to learn this sort of uh, conditioned emotional response. So if we destroy the amygdala of a rat and we shock it, you know, ring the bell, shock, ring the bell, shock, we can do that forever. And it's never going to catch on, right? It's just going to go, well, I guess there it is. Uh, there's a bell. Oh, and I got shocked again. That was fun. Uh, same thing happens in monkeys, actually. Uh, so they, they uh, monkeys, uh, sometimes there are monkeys who don't have, you know, they, they'll have damage to their amygdala or something, and they're, they're overly aggressive. They bite each other's fingers off, all kinds of crazy things. I know, right? There you go. And they don't get worked up about it. They're like, this in a finger. Uh, I don't have an amygdala, so who cares? So there you go. Uh, what about people, right? I mean, who really cares about rats? What about people? Uh, the amygdala is involved in emotional memory. There's one well emotional responses. If uh, someone has damage to their amygdala, this can be uh, neurological disorder. This can be brain damage. This can be, uh, you know, like disease or accident. They actually have a decrease in their emotional responses. That's not, not surprising. They're not able to sort of pair that emotional uh, response with that event, right? So they have difficulty with that same condition emotional response that you're going to have when you have with the rats. And it actually has some effects on uh, memory, like uh, effects of uh, emotional memory, right? So there was a study a number of years ago with some folks in Japan. Uh, these were folks who had damage to their amygdala uh, due to uh, you know, like a neurodegenerative disease. And there was a horrible earthquake in Japan. They ask these folks about it. Now, if you ask most people, you know, you know if you've lived through a, a pretty uh, bad sort of natural disaster, if you've lived through an earthquake, you might describe that in some very emotional terms, right? I was scared. Everybody was screaming and crying. I hid under a desk. I was frightened. I didn't know what was going on. A lot of confusion, right? It seems reasonable if you're in the midst of a, of a major earthquake, right? Uh, these folks who uh, had damage to their amygdala, they were like, oh, yeah, that happened on a Tuesday. I think I was eating a turkey sandwich. Uh, walls just started shaking. I don't know. TV went off. Kept eating the turkey sandwich. And that stuff doesn't keep very long. You've got to finish it. So they had difficulty with the emotional memory. Right? They didn't really kind of encode that. Now, in terms of this extinction process, right? So we talked briefly about that when we talked about perhaps your older brother matured to the point where they're not punching you in the ribs anymore, right, Paris? So we get to that point. And you can kind of relax. You can go to your like family dinners, right? You can go, okay, I can sit next to this guy. He's not going to stick his finger in my mashed potatoes or, you know, whatever typical stuff they do, right? And so that's called extinction, right? So you've not forgotten what's going on. You just no longer associate that particular stimulus 
uh, with something negative, right? So when we were shocking the ramp and we were uh, signaling with the bell and then a shock, if we just continue to signal with the bell and we don't do any shocking, right? And we do that for an extended period of time, what will eventually happen, Autumn, is, is that the rat will go, oh, well, that was a bell, but I've not been shocked in, you know, like three days, so there's no sense in me really getting worked up about it. This bell is no longer a great predictor of some negative outcome, right? So I don't have to get worked up about it, so I'm not going to get excited. Now, the first time we tried to train this rat, let's say it took us 25 tries before the rat finally caught on. Oh, yeah, bell, shock. I got it. it. Took him 25 times to learn, right? If after this extinction period we do bell and then we do shock, instantly the rat will start to have that fear response just to the bell, right? So there's no learning curve the second time around. That's what we mean by you're not forgetting something. I mean, that, that pattern is still there, right? You still have them, and I'm trying not to get you too bogged down with the learning mechanisms. Again, we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. But that, that, memory is still there, you've just sort of uh, turned it off, right? Because it's no longer a good predictor of that outcome. So if your brother all of a sudden has like a, a brief lapse in maturity, uh, Casey, and the next time you go to dinner, there's a pop in the ribs, you're right back to flinching every time you see him, right? Give your brother's number, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send him a text message to rib punch you next time. No, I'm not going to do that. I don't do it to my sister. I got a younger brother. <laughs> I give my brother a pretty hard time when I can. <laughs> He's earned most of it if you knew him. I agree. No, my, my bro actually, uh, my brother's beyond the gap. Uh, he, he's 11 years younger than I am. So it's, you know, like a 16 year old beating up on a five year old. It's like, there's something wrong with this. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, of course now he's like, you know, 62 to 60. So, I mean, I mean, if I were to try to punch him in the ribs now, we, you know, it might Sounds be a, like emotional punching. Yeah. <laughs> now, the only thing I, I give him a hard time about is his hair. Because um, I, I have more hair than he does. And that's like, you know. That's saying a lot. It is. <laughs> <laughs> He's like 10 years younger than I am, too. And I'm like, oh. now his is still like, has color in it. So I guess he's got that on me. I was like, I, I got more than you do. So. All right. <laughs> All right, this is basically what I just told you. Except uh, we didn't need to talk about this extinction process, right? And let's go back to the correct slide and the involvement of what we call the medial prefrontal cortex, okay? So, what, we know the amygdala is responsible for that fear response, right? For that sort of immediate first line, oh, there's something horrible, I need to get my hormones rolling, I need to get these other things going right, I need to be prepared for this because it could be a dangerous situation, right? But there are other, there are many times when you kind of start in that direction and you realize pretty quickly, like, oh, I'm fine, right? Nothing to worry about. Uh, how many of you have ever heard, uh, maybe this is a bad example because you guys probably have extinguished this behavior. Um, if you're out on the street and you hear like a loud bang, right? <laughs> Abby got that one. You got that one pretty quickly, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so for a lot of folks, if you're out walking the street and you hear like a loud bang, you're gonna kind of flinch, right? Because you probably don't hear that very often, hopefully. Uh, some folks hear that more often than others, depending on where you live. And it kind of depends on your neighborhood, right? So uh, you can imagine, oh, I hear a loud bang. Well, what was that? I got excited. You turn around, and it's just like, you know, somebody, you know, dropped a glass bottle, or somebody's car backfired, right? All kinds of things can happen. You go, okay, I'm fine. Uh, your medial prefrontal cortex is going to be involved in that process, right? In that process of trying to shut down that fear response, okay? So this is important, it's impulse control. Okay. Hey Casey, did I ever tell you about the time I went into a haunted cornfield with my friend? This is a great story. So uh, this was a number of years ago, right? I was in high school, I thought, oh, we'll go to this haunted cornfield. Well, 
somehow we accidentally showed up early. It was still dark, right? It was like in October. We showed up early, and we were the only two people there, right? And so we go out to this like cornfield maze, right? We're just like walking around. And there's, uh, you know, this friend of mine, and he's like, uh, you know, let's go to this cornfield maze. I was like, all right, whatever. So we go, and we're just like walking around. And so we're the only two people in the maze, right? Because, uh, I mean, the, the folks just took our money and let us go in, right? I guess they went in there, so fun. And so they, they're constantly like trying to like scare you and things. I'm like, okay, whatever, this is ridiculous, right? Uh, they keep squirting my friend in the ear with a squirt gun, which, which apparently was really irritating, right? And then, uh, this is the worst part. So then we're just like walking along. And you know everything's fake in these, right? Because they can't hurt you, right? Like, you, you know this, right? Or at least you should. A guy jumps out with a chainsaw, which is pretty typical, right? I mean, it's just like standard, like it's Halloween, you're in a cornfield, there's going to be a chainsaw, right? You should just expect it. Didn't realize my friend has some weird fear of chainsaws. Uh, he, he turns, he screams, pushes me in the, like puts his hand right in my chest and pushes me down, in the, and I'm just like going into the corn, and he runs like 30 yards in this cornfield, right? And at that point, Right, and then at that point, the, the gig's up, right? I mean, because the, the guys should start laughing, like, who are running the cornfield, because they thought it was hilarious, and it was. And so at that point, they were just like, here's the way out, guys. This is done. You can't keep this up. Uh, so he had this immediate sort of fear response. I don't know where his uh, medial prefrontal cortex was that day. It was on break. And no impulse control, right? If you go in one of these, uh, you know, kind of haunted house situations, they, they do things to get you to have that initial response, right? But a lot of folks have a little better, you know, sort of impulse control, and they're like, oh, that's not a real vampire. Uh, I don't need to work the, the real ones you really got to watch out for. Those, those fake ones, not so bad. And so they get a little worked up about it, and you just move on, right? Uh, because most people have a medial prefrontal cortex that works. Uh, my friend that day, I don't know what happened. He did not have his medial prefrontal cortex with him. And he just took off running. It was hilarious. I'm even laughing as I'm falling down. Like, this is hilarious. You know, that you're trying to, like, where was he even running? It's like, no way. You don't, even, you don't know where you are, right? You're just, like, running in random directions. Just whatever. So there you go. That's a great uh, prefrontal cortex story. I wish I had, now I'm wishing I had, like, a portable fMRI machine on him. You know, it's like, hey, what's your, what's your medial prefrontal cortex doing? Nothing. All right. So, still, uh, the medial prefrontal cortex has sort of separate parts, right? One of these is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the VMPFC. This guy's pretty awesome, really important for the analysis of complex social situations. How many of you have ever been in a complex social situation? That's not like, Paris, that's not a trick question. It just happens, right? Like most social situations are fairly complex, right? You get a couple people involved, you're in a different situation, you gotta figure out what's appropriate behavior and what's not, right? So for example, uh, there's a set of behaviors that are appropriate here. You know, we're in like a fairly large group of, of folks, right? So you're here and th there's an, a certain set of behaviors that are acceptable. Most of you folks are doing them. There are a couple of you, Casey's taking down your names or not. Uh, we'll take care of that later. But Paige, let's imagine we're somewhere else, right? Like you're at the Cam Henderson Center. <clears throat> and there's a large group of people. There's a certain set of behaviors that's acceptable there, right? That's not acceptable here. Like you can yell and you can scream, right? Uh, you can jump up and down. Those are not appropriate behaviors in this class, okay? But they're definitely appropriate behaviors uh, at a sporting event, right? Except golf. Tennis, I guess tennis. You kind of have to wait on tennis, right? You're not supposed to make a lot of noise at tennis matches. There you go. I think that's it, right? What about curling? Are there rules about making noise during curling matches? Anybody know? No, they do. Like cheer for I guess they do. Let's imagine you can. All right. Uh, we already talked about extinction. That's just there with the rat. Here is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. It's right down here. Ventral means on the bottom, medial means in the middle, and uh, prefrontal obviously means in, like kind of before the frontal way. Right? How many of you know about Phineas Gage? This guy, wow, he was awesome, right? Uh, I don't know why, but he just decided I'm gonna shoot a missile through my head. Sounds like a great idea, right? 
uh, I don't think he did it on purpose. So uh, if you're going to blow up the side of a mountain, right, because you want to put a road or a, uh, like a railway through there, there's really only one way to do it. You got to drill holes, you got to put dynamite in the bottom, you got to make sure it gets all the way to the bottom of that hole, right? And then you've got to ignite that dynamite, okay? Uh, and you can see evidence of this when you travel, right? And if you look on the facing of rocks, you can see the boreholes, right? Because they're half the borehole, right? The other half got blown off. Now, previously, uh, this was all done by hand, right? And so some guy would drill a hole, and then some guy would put the dynamite in the hole, and then some guy, I guess he drew the short stick. Um, although it's not that short of a stick, really. Uh, he would have to take about a four foot long piece of metal, a spike, right? It's maybe three or four inches in diameter and tapered. It's called a tamping rod, and he'd have to take that and jam the dynamite down into the bottom of that hole, right? Which is fine, ex except they also put like the blasting cap on top, right? Um, and occasionally, if you hit that just right, it would go ahead and explode, right? And so this happened to Phineas Gage. He's jabbing that tamping rod down in the hole. Well, the dynamite explodes, and it shoots that metal up through the bottom of his head, and about 30, I know, right? I mean, I don't know. It seems like a real, real headache, right? I mean, and then it, it went 30 or 40 feet away from him. Like, I mean, we're not talking about it just like went up and was like, oh, that was painful, right? Uh, it went all the way through his head and continued to fly like a rocket, right? I mean, I ran into the back of a parked truck once on a bicycle. <laughs> Uh, that was painful, but I just can't imagine. Lately, I was trying to simultaneously watch a baseball game and ride a bicycle, which didn't work. Uh, I, ended up, I bit through my lip. I hit, I hit it so hard, it just bit all the way through it. Uh, I'm sorry? That's awful. Like, yeah, I'm it, trying to picture that all it's happening. A pretty bad experience. I mean, I was like six, so I mean, it's like... I mean, it wasn't like last week. <laughs> I my lesson. Uh, I, have a fear, I have a fear of bicycles. Uh, but, so Phineas Gage, uh, amazingly, this guy lived through it, right? Most of the time, if you shoot a metal rod through your head, that's the end of the story for you, right? Uh, but this guy managed to live even though he just like blasted this rocket through there. Uh, the weird thing was his personality completely changed, right? He would do sort of weird behaviors at, at, at the wrong time, right? Because his ventromedial prefrontal cortex was gone, he wasn't able to analyze those complex social situations, right? So he didn't know, should I just sit down and be quiet or should I stand up and like, you know, cheer and yell? And so he had some difficulty with that. His personality sort of changed. He was really, um, he'd previously been a pretty nice guy, but a lot of times he came off with someone who was not uh, very nice, right? But again, he didn't understand the social situations, right? He had no ability to do that. All right. We've already talked about those guys. Not a big deal. Now, how many of you have ever had to deal with children? I'm very sorry. Uh, so, one of the interesting things about humans is as soon as you slide out of the uterus, your amygdala is ready to roll. And that's, that's great because fear is such an important emotion and an important response to survival, if you take any time, right, developing the fear nucleus, developing that fear response, something might kill you, right? Can you imagine if you don't develop fear until you're like 35? Think of, it doesn't work that way, right? I mean, just like, think of all the stuff, like what would you do? You'd walk off the edge of something, like, hey, what's that? You're done, right? You have to have fear from the beginning. And there are actually some, some people argue, uh, and there's different evidence one way or the other, about innate fears. Uh, and one of those innate fears seems to be a fear of heights, right? Which again, that makes a lot of sense because heights can cause damage, right? There also seems to be a fear of strangers, right? Uh, that seems to be a rather innate fear. And then uh, snakes, right? Some people argue that there's an innate fear of snakes. Uh, what's interesting is that fear of snakes seems to be present across uh, most, if not all, primates, right? Now, this doesn't make a lot of sense. How many of you have spent your whole lives in West Virginia? And don't, don't, it's not a, I'm just saying, like, there you go, right? Uh, it, 
you should not be afraid of snakes. It's like a waste of time, right? Casey, can you look up how many snakes in the state of West Virginia can kill you? The answer is going to be somewhere between zero and probably zero. Uh, there aren't, like, as a full-grown adult, there aren't a lot of snakes in the state of West Virginia you've got to really worry about. And I, I know somebody's going to go, well, like, what about? I was like, yeah, what about? You're going to get bit and you're going to drive to the hospital. You're going to be fine. Right? I'm not saying you're not going to have a little pain and irritation, you know, and it's not like you get bit and, like, wait three weeks to go to the hospital. It'll go pretty quickly. Uh, but we're not talking about deadly poisonous snakes here in the state of West Virginia, right? So if this is your environment where you've always been, it doesn't make a lot of sense to really be afraid of snakes, does it? The problem is, as a species, uh, we didn't really start in West Virginia. Uh, which two? There are two snakes that can kill you in West Virginia. What are those? The timber rattlesnake and copperhead. Uh, the timber rattlesnake you might be afraid of slightly. The copperhead, like maybe four of them. But otherwise, you're going to be right, Scotty. You'll be fine. You can just get those things to juggle. Uh, <laughs> Everybody juggles snakes? I have to answer that. <laughs> so, uh, maybe two snakes, right? When was the last time any of you saw a snake accidentally? Yeah, never, right? You can't even remember when it happened, right? Okay, that's how long ago it was. Now, our species, though, uh, we evolved on a completely different continent, right? Where there are some extremely deadly snakes. Uh, Casey, would you care to look up how many species of snakes there are in sub-Saharan Africa that can kill you? We're going to figure this out. I, I can tell you it's more than two. I don't have the number off the top of my head. Uh, because you don't just have to worry about the snakes that are poisonous, but they've got those big ones too, right? I mean, how long do you think the biggest snake is in West Virginia? Eight feet, maybe? Right? I mean, what, what's, what's, what's an eight feet long snake going to do to you? Nothing. Is the Google not telling you this? <laughs> How many of you fell prey to the screen cleaner? Nobody, nobody. <clears throat> Anybody use files from Google? It was their April Fool's joke. They had a screen cleaner. They say it would clean your screen of your phone from the inside out. I thought it was funny. <laughs> Wow. That's pretty serious. And that's with like like a lot of those places have modern medicine, a lot of those places have access to you know, right? Okay, so that's like a lot, right? So our, our species at least developed in a place where being afraid of snakes probably was important to survival. Uh, we've not managed to get rid of that fear, right? So most people do have some sort of innate fear of snakes. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But your amygdala matures very early in development, right? You can get those anger and those violent reactions. How many of you have ever seen one of those uh, little kids at the store like pitching a fit because they didn't get a pack of bubble gum or a Power Ranger or I don't know whatever it is little kids are into these days? Uh, it happens, right? You don't see a lot of adults do that. I'm not saying you don't see adults. I just say you don't see a lot of adults, right? The proportion changes a little bit. Uh, once you get into late adulthood or late childhood, early adulthood, that prefrontal cortex starts to develop more, right? You start to have that impulse control. You start to realize, hmm, I bet if I don't get that Power Ranger, I'm not really going to die. So I probably, you know, probably don't have to scream about it. Uh, you know, so... So there you go. So you get uh, you get some other nuance there, right? And you actually start suppressing behavior because you actually start to see the negative consequences of your behavior, right? Now let's imagine you're 17 and your mom won't buy you a Power Ranger and you throw a fit about that at the store. You start to realize, like, right, Tiffany, the, the negative consequences of that, right? And you're like, people are going to think I'm just like an idiot if I do this and I don't want to get embarrassed, so uh, I probably won't even ask for a Power Ranger. You guys buy Power Rangers? Was that a thing? No? Great. Makes me feel better about you having it. Having it's plus a Green Ranger. I don't, is that one of the Power Rangers, the green one? Was there a green one? Nobody knows. There was. Thank you, Casey. All right. Uh, what about aggression, right? Aggression is sort of important. 
You guys like aggression? How many of you want to take a whole class on aggression? Nobody, nobody's going to do that. I have zero people in my class next semester. If you thought this class was great, sign up for that one. Uh, is anybody in here who's taken that class? I don't think so. We spent about an hour and a half once talking about a hamster. It was fun. His name was Hamstar. It was like a real hamster. He won a, won a race at a Petco or something. And <laughs> that's like an interesting story. Uh, so when we're talking about aggressive behavior, we have threat behavior, but there's also uh, defensive behavior, submissive behavior, and uh, often folks don't really include predation in uh, aggressive behavior. Aggressive behavior is typically uh, geared or directed toward what we call a conspecific, right? So someone else who's a member of your species. So if you are, uh, I don't know, what's your favorite predator? Um, if you're a, uh, I don't know, tiger and you're trying to eat a tapir, I don't know, right? But I guess that's what they eat. Uh, that's not really aggression, that's just like I'm hungry. You know, it's like, it's not really aggression if you like try to eat a hamburger, right? Uh, it's just you eating something, right? Aggression is like, you know, when you kick your roommate because they didn't clean up after themselves or something. That thing, you, you had some knowing chuckle with that, right? Like how often do you kick your roommate? You kicked him the other day? You didn't really have to share that. And, I, uh, and I'm not sure, I don't have to tell anybody, but Casey may have to. Do you have to tell people that? Are you a mandatory reporter? You've got to watch what you say. I don't care enough to be one of those. Come on, you leave a mark, you're good. Oh, seriously? Yeah, for a lot of injuries, I say, if there's a mark? So what do you do with like the old uh, soap in the tube sock, the tube sock trick? Huh? You guys don't know about that? Yeah. If you really want it. <laughs> uh, if you put soap in a tube sock and whack somebody with it, it doesn't leave a mark, right? That's what I've been told. I mean, I've been operating under those assumptions for a while. <laughs> Let's hope that's true. I just walk around Fifth Avenue, <laughs> soap. Are you looking this up? Oh. Recording it. <laughs> you are recording it. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Giving you guys great stuff. Uh, nobody watches these. Um, there are a couple people who've left a comment. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, yeah. The only other comment I got was from the Psycho Farm class. Uh, the marijuana lecture, someone wrote 420, legalize it. <laughs> With two exclamation points. It's like, all right, I mean, you know, whatever. They're not even in my class. <laughs> yeah, I wish someone in my class had left the time. All right, uh, so anyway, there's different circuitry for aggressive and defensive behaviors and predation. There's like different brain regions involved. I'm not going to ask you too much about that. Uh, how many of you love serotonin? That's a thing, right? Uh, serotonin is uh, sort of interesting. It actually inhibits aggressive, aggressive behavior, right? It also decreases irritability, which is kind of interesting. This is probably, and you wouldn't think it, this is probably the most complicated graph I will ever show you. And so I don't really want you to think about what's on this graph, right? Because when I'm going to tell you what it means, and if you tried to pull it out of, of, of this, Trevor, you'd never do it. Because it took me like three years to figure it out. And I was like, I, I just thought it was the wrong slide. And I was like, I'm just going to tell you the story about the monkeys anyway, but this is the wrong slide, I'm sure. Uh, but it's the correct slide. It just, it's, it's really complicated, right? So basically what they did is they grabbed a bunch of monkeys. And they took some blood. And they measured like 5-HIAA. Uh, this is a metabolite of serotonin. Okay, so this is a way that you can measure serotonin levels, right? So we can say, like, if you have high serotonin or low serotonin, we can tell that by looking at this metabolite, right? And so what they did is they, they sort of uh, examined the behavior of these monkeys, and the important behavior was, are they dead or alive, right? And what they found is that over the course of the period of this study, 
monkeys who were more likely to die had lower serotonin levels, right? Which means that they were more aggressive and they exhibited more risk-taking behavior. The monkeys who seemed to live longer and were alive at the end of the study were more likely to have high serotonin levels. They were a little more relaxed, laid back. They weren't doing those high risk behaviors. Okay? So for a monkey, what, what, what's kind of a risk-taking behavior? Fighting a bigger monkey, right? Monkeys fight all the time for these dominance hierarchies. So if you're a monkey, you don't have much serotonin, you might try to fight a monkey that's too big. Okay? Uh, that can get you killed, right? The other things monkeys do, they jump, right? And so they might go, I can make that. Uh, and they can't, right? And so then they fall down and they get injured. Okay, now, if you think you can pull that out of that graph, you'll probably, you know, I don't know. Your IQ is like four standard deviations above average. Uh, because this crisscross thing is just a little confusing, I think, right, Abby? It's like dead or alive monkeys and high or low serotonin. You got it? Okay, good. Do you have a pet monkey at home? Is that why? So the idea is uh, high serotonin levels, low risk taking, low aggressive. That's pretty awesome. The sort of problem with that is, you, you know, then you think, well, why, why are there people with low serotonin levels, right? Why is that important? Okay. Uh, you want some variation in this across the population, right? Can you imagine if we were a group of uh, uh, folks who never took risks, right? So if you dial it back a few generations and you're thinking about your ancestors, and they're like, oh, man, we've run out of food in this spot. What are we going to do? And then one person is like, oh, you know, well, we could try that group of trees across the river. And somebody else is like, that's too risky. We'll just sit here and starve. Um, guess what happened to those folks? None of them are your ancestors. They all died. Your ancestors were the idiots who tried to swim the river. Probably not the first idiot who tried to swim the river. He drowned. But the second idiot who learned from the first idiot's mistake, right, and actually made it to the other side. That's, uh, that's who we can all think for for our existence today. Does that make sense? Uh, what about aggression in males versus females? Males tend to be more aggressive, right? Uh, males also tend to have, oh geez, what was the name of that hormone that males have more of? Yeah, testosterone, right? So there you go. Uh, higher testosterone is correlated with higher aggressive behavior. Uh, that's across the board with just about every species, whether you're a human, a monkey, or a lobster. Um, if you jack up uh, testosterone levels, you become more aggressive. Now, females, uh, things are a little different there. Not as aggressive, still uh, facilitated by testosterone. Uh, that's not including this one group of females. Right? There's some other hormones and things involved there with maternal aggression. That's sort of a separate story uh, that, that we don't have time to get into here. Right, Keely? But if you're really interested, PSY391, it's a real winner. I don't even know if that's the right course number. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. Not this one, but the next one. Uh, one of my favorite pictures, right? So if little kids are aggressive, you should always give them psychoactive drugs. I think that's what you get from this. Uh, probably not the best idea, right? Um, if little kids are always aggressive, just lock them in a room somewhere. They'll grow out of it. Don't think that's accurate. Could be. You never know. Never know that somebody tries. Uh, here's the basic story. Not enough serotonin. It gets, you know, jammed up and stuff, and this kid's kind of aggressive. Uh, here he is once he gets some extra serotonin. I just worry about his face, though. Doesn't he look like I'm going to get you later? Uh, <laughs> He's still got that look. I'm calm right now, but wait till these meds wear off. <laughs> I know the half-life on this pill. Uh, and so I, I think he's still going to uh, take care of this kid with the hat. Right? See, that's why he's still got his fist clenched here. He's just ready, just in case. Right? So there you go. Uh, did it, uh, what's this? Oh, this is uh, females. They gave female rats testosterone. Guess what they did? They attacked other female rats. It's not a surprise, right? It's like, hey, let's see what happens. And that's what happened. So you could do this yourself, right? If you decide, like, boy, oh, I wish I was a little more aggressive, just you know, start shooting in more testosterone, see what happens. It'll work. I mean, you'll start yelling at the people with Kroger, but that's OK. Some of them deserve it. Right, Keelan? Yeah. Yeah. Do you work at Kroger? No. No. I couldn't work there. 
Like the, the old people who come through and they're like, I've never used my pen at Kroger. I'm like, you have for the last five years. I saw you in here two weeks ago, say the same thing. I'm like, I know this, get out of my way. I just go through the self-checkout line and mess things up a few times and then that person comes over and just checks me out and I'm done. Thank you, that was me, probably. <laughs> it probably has been. I go in and I'm like, ah, this isn't working. And somebody comes over like, I'll just do this for you so we can get you out of the store. It's, like, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's brilliant. It's it brilliant. Is. It is. Are they allowed to do that? I mean, they do. They do. Or sometimes I, because I used to work there and I used to work the self-checkout. And I would sometimes see them, and I would just know that they don't know how to do it. And so I would just go ahead and take over. Yeah, I really practiced that face. It's <laughs> <laughs> the fastest way to get help. <laughs> All right, hey, who remembers a chart like this before? Right? We sort of saw a chart like this two weeks ago. I know it's all been blanked out by like spring break, but if you go back and look, we saw a similar chart. Basically, uh, we were giving uh, organizational versus activational effects, right? So if we put in some testosterone early and then we don't give them any testosterone later, well, they're not going to be aggressive. If we don't give them testosterone at birth and we do give them testosterone later, their, their brains haven't developed in a way that testosterone is going to increase aggressive behavior, right? So you have to be sort of uh, exposed to some testosterone in the beginning. So now, Mary, I'm rethinking that, like time I told you to take testosterone to be more aggressive, so I'm gonna go out on the limb and say you probably weren't experienced a lot of testosterone at birth. Uh, so adding testosterone later is not gonna do as much for you, right? But, had you been exposed to testosterone at birth, and then, you know, we uh, gave you a good dose of testosterone later, definitely gonna be aggressive. This again was in female rats, right? So they gave female rats that were just born a, a shot of testosterone, and then they uh, hit them with that. This is a fun story, too. Uh, this, is, by the way, is a mouse uterus. I don't know if any of you have ever seen one of those. Uh, so there you go. Take a good look and just absorb it all. Uh, the cool thing about a mouse uterus and, and most other sort of rodents is they're two-horned, right, which, which means you have one horn and there's another horn. Uh, the human uterus is only... There's only like one horn, I guess. I don't know if you would call it one horn, but uh, there's, there's not two, two sides to it, right? Uh, this is how it works with, with mice and rats, gerbils, whatever. Uh, the interesting thing about this is you can put, you know, uh, a fetus in there, and you can kind of put them in like, like peas in a pot, right? And because you have multiple uh, offspring in one birth, you can really start to look at some cool stuff. So basically, if we're looking at females, Right? There are three kinds of females that we can get. One that's called a 0M female, which means she was not next to a male. There's a 1M female who was next to a male. And then there's the 2M female who was surrounded uh, by two males. Right? So you can see why this wouldn't happen in humans. Uh, most of the time, humans come out one at a time. Right? That's the first thing. Even when you get more than one at a time, they're all just kind of sloshing around in there, right? So maybe you get two, often those two are going to be the same, right? So if you do happen to get a male and a female in there, that, that's fine. Uh, that happens occasionally, but not often enough to really make the strong, as strong of a conclusion as we can make here. But this brings us back to that prenatal androgenization concept. How many of you have written this word down before, or this phrase? Hopefully you did two weeks ago, because we talked about it then, we're going to talk about it now, right? I would be ready if I was you. If we've talked about this like two different weeks, uh, I'd be ready to, to write a whole lot about this. Uh, come, what is that, like May 7th or something like that? Right? Is that the Tuesday of finals week, May 7th? Yeah. Yeah, I'd be ready to write a whole bunch about prenatal androgenization and the effects of hormones on behavior. Because again, we've, we've talked about it now twice, right? So it's kind of an important concept. I'm not really trying to surprise you here. I'm simply saying, just be ready for it, because I'm going to ask you. Okay. Uh, prenatal androgenization will increase aggressiveness in every single species that has been studied, uh, including humans, right? Human males are more aggressive than females. Uh, human females who share a uterus with a male, right? So we're talking about fraternal twins here, one male, one female. Uh, those females tend to be more aggressive on average uh, than other females. So there you go. 
pretty straightforward story, right? So if you want to have a really aggressive female offspring, try to have a male offspring at the same time. I'm sure there are ways you can make that happen. It's, it's all just random. All right. Here's kind of an interesting story about uh, mating season, alcohol, and monkeys. Uh, I know. I mean, how many of you thought, well, we're going to get a story about drunk mating monkeys today? But we are. So this is sort of sort of an interesting story. This is another sort of complicated graph, but I think there's some cool things we can pull out of this. The first thing is we want to look at, uh, this is frequency of aggressive behavior, right? And there are two groups of monkeys. We have our dominant monkeys and our subordinate monkeys, right? The easy thing to see here is no matter what other condition is present, dominant monkeys are more aggressive than subordinate monkeys, right? Because monkeys create these hierarchies, they create these hierarchies by sort of fighting and working their way up. And the dominant monkeys are probably going to be more aggressive. They need to maintain that hierarchy. They need to maintain stay at the top. Okay, so that's interesting. Second thing, like, let's look at mating season, right? And what's really interesting with this, I think, is um, if you look at the subordinate monkeys and whether they were exposed to alcohol or not, their aggressive behavior pretty much stays the same during mating season, right? But what you see with the dominant monkeys is actually a massive increase in uh, aggressive behavior during mating season if they ingest alcohol as well, right? If they're given alcohol as well, which I think is sort of an interesting uh, sort of thing to look at. If you look at the non-mating season, what's interesting here is actually uh, subordinate monkeys are slightly more aggressive during non-mating season than they are in mating season. Uh, this could be because those dominant monkeys are less aggressive during that time, right? And so that could allow those uh, subordinate monkeys to be a little more aggressive. There's also a slight uptick in um, alcohol or aggression uh, if the subordinate monkeys are given alcohol. And again, we do see an increase in aggression in dominant monkeys if they have alcohol as well, even if they're out of mating season. So I think that's sort of, sort of an interesting uh, sort of intersection there between mating season, uh, hierarchy status, and the presence or absence of alcohol, right? I think that really, I, know, I think there's a lot there to think about. Hey, Casey, for domestic violence, how many of those cases involve alcohol? 125%? Something like that? Say a great deal. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so if you think about this in humans, we've sort of done the same study accidentally, right? Uh, we didn't really mean to. So it's the same thing, right? Most uh, domestic violence situations involve alcohol. It's pretty obvious here alcohol increases aggressive behavior, uh, particularly in that uh, mating season category, right? Which I think is sort of an interesting uh, thing to think about. I don't know. Anybody else find that fascinating? No? All right. That's fine. <clears throat> All right. Hey, let's think about this uh, impulse control, right? Uh, folks who are impulsively violent, that's typically because they're not able to regulate their uh, emotions, right? That doesn't really tell you a lot to help prevent that, but, but there you go. And again, a lot of this is going to be that uh, prefrontal cortex business. Here's a nice uh, drawing of Phineas Gage. For those of you that are not anatomists, you're only supposed to have one hole in the bottom of your head. It's that one. You're not supposed to have the second one here, right? That was an add-on. Just, uh, you know, that was a uh, fashion feature. There, you know, and you can see where that just blasted through his head and took out uh, his medial or his ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And here's the the tamping rod. They actually had to break it in half to, to like kind of put it on this drawing uh, because it was so long. Like if they had drawn it to scale, it it would have you know made his his head look like too small for you to see. It. Just blasted through the head. Hey, hey, there's a snake. Who loves that? How many of you want to move back a few rows? Nobody's going to admit to it, right? Uh, this was an interesting study where they put folks um, in an fMRI machine. So that in and of itself can cause people to have a little freak out, right? I don't know if you've ever been in an fMRI machine. Um, it's sort of like they put you in the middle of a jet engine and turn it on and tell you not to move for like six hours, <laughs> right? Because they stick you in there and it's loud. There's this like giant bazillion pound magnet that's got to whirl around 
and try to suck all the lead out of you, right, or whatever it does. Uh, so they put you in this fMRI machine, and they let you sort of control this conveyor belt, and they put a snake on a conveyor belt. Snakes on a conveyor belt sounds like a sequel to a brilliant film. Uh, I don't know, right? <clears throat> I, I didn't see that one. I'm going to choose to watch uh, other Samuel L. Jackson films, uh, ones that were actually pretty good. I don't think Snakes on a Plane's in that category. Amazingly, that was based on a true story. Did you guys know that? Yeah, now your life has changed. <laughs> it was based on a true story. Seriously, they say I'm not making that up. You can look it up. It's based on if you're going to do it and tell everyone I was right. Because it's based on a true story. So, uh, you either get a snake or a toy bear, right? And so, what you have to do is you have to bring that conveyor belt as close to you as you can. Now, there is like a protective screen there, right? So the snake or the bear won't attack you. You have to worry about that toy bear. Of course, everyone in the study was like, bring the bear over, right? Not a problem. They just bring it over, scan the brain like everything's fine. For the snake, what was fascinating is as people would bring the snake closer, right, guess what would happen? That ventromedial prefrontal cortex would start to get more active, right? That impulse control. Normally you're going to go, I'm not bringing a snake up to my face, right? It just seems like a bad idea. But in this case, you know, you're protected, you know everything's fine, so you can bring the snake closer. So you control that impulse, right? And that ventromedial prefrontal cortex is going to be involved. So there you go. You can measure uh, your courage by how active your ventromedial prefrontal cortex is. It's pretty interesting, right? Must not worry about that. That's just development of the amygdala lifespan. We've already talked about that. That was interesting. Uh, moral judgments. Oh, this is something. Yeah. Uh, so, how many of you are familiar with the trolley problem? It's interesting, right? And there are about, oh, 800,000 variations of the trolley problem, right? But at its sort of most basic uh, setup, the trolley problem is this. There are sort of two versions that are the basic versions. Here you are. You don't know what to do. There's a lever. There's a trolley. For those of you that don't know what a trolley is, just imagine it's a train. Uh, it's the same thing, basically, right? Trolley's coming down. You've got to pull a lever. The trolley's either going to go run over these uh, five people or over this one person, right? And for our purposes, we're going to assume they're all equally good or bad people. It doesn't really matter, right? Because if you start to get into the, well, like, what if that one person is, like, really awesome and those five people are horrible, right? And then there's, like, all kinds of things, and then it just gets crazy. So we're not going to go down that path, right? But we have to go down one of these paths. And you have to kill five people with this trolley, or you have to kill one person with this trolley, right? Okay? Now... This example is pretty straightforward, right? You know what you're going to do, right? You're going to pull and run over the five. Uh, <laughs> just making sure you were paying attention. Uh, you're going to pull and you're going to run over the one, right? Because in general, if I'm forcing you to choose the death of individuals, you're going to choose the death of fewer individuals, right, over more individuals. That's typically how it goes, okay? So you're going to run over one. That's pretty straightforward, that's pretty simple. Your ventromedial prefrontal cortex goes, well, okay. okay. Now, in the next sort of problem, this becomes a little more personal, right? So you're on a bridge and there's this guy, and let's imagine for whatever reason, this is the only man in the world whose body can stop a trolley. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know why, because, but it just is. Let's imagine that's the case. Because if it wasn't, then they would hit this first person and then the other four would live, right? But, we're not going to imagine that's how it is. So, here's your choice. You let the trolley go through and it's going to kill five people. Or, you physically push this guy off a bridge and he stops the trolley. Now, that becomes a different sort of situation, right? Because now it's not you pulling a lever and you're disconnected from this person. You've got to put your hands on him and push him. Right? Now, once you think about this and you work your way through it, most of you uh, would go, oh, yeah, I have a blast pushing that guy off the bridge. That sounds like fun. Uh, so hopefully, you know, most people would probably choose to push them off the bridge. You wouldn't want to do that, right? Because it's going to be uncomfortable for you, but that's better than letting five people die, right? Because, again, we're just doing some raw math here. Now, the problem is here, in this case, 
your ventral medial prefrontal cortex is much more involved, right? Because remember how we said we're impulse control, we're evaluating complex social situations, right? This is a much different situation, morally speaking, uh, than this other situation over here. <coughs> so this is probably how we should all make all of our moral decisions, right? How much does your ventral medial prefrontal cortex get involved? And then we can decide if that's a difficult situation or not. Right? No, nobody's, I don't know. It makes it easy, right? Maybe we could mete out judgments for people, right? Like, should you really like, like what if somebody has a faulty ventral medial prefrontal cortex, right? Should you really like punish them? A whole lot for that, it's not their fault, right? I don't know, right? Give people a brain scan before you sentence them. Like, what's gonna be the most effective sentence for this person uh, based on their capability to make adjustments to their behavior and to uh, control impulses? I don't know. You guys can think about that. So did you look up snakes on a plane? I did, and it was based off of brown snakes that were caught on planes during World War II. Brown snakes are pretty dangerous. Yeah. They're all over the place in, uh, like, Guam, right? So Guam's pretty well covered. They probably should have killed all the brown snakes uh, back when there were, like, 200 of them, but now there's, like, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and there's no way they're going to get rid of them. Yeah, it's a real problem. You should really sink the whole island now if you want to get rid of snakes. There's no way around. All because of bananas, right? Mm -hmm. I hit the random article button on Wiki, uh, uh, Wikipedia too often. Uh, not a lot here. This is just a real sort of basic story. Like, hey, who loves brownies? Well, you're supposed to make them with walnuts, but uh, maybe you don't have walnuts. Put make a damia nuts on them. Your ventral medial prefrontal cortex not getting involved, right? Uh, speedboat, you're still a speedboat, and uh, you know you try to get people out of the way. Not a big deal. Uh, prefrontal cortex gets a little involved, but what if you're on a cruise ship? Uh, who are you throwing over off the lifeboat first, right? That's a tough choice, right? Like you and five other people are on a lifeboat, but you've only got enough food and water for six or for five people, not six, right? You've got to throw somebody over. Who goes first? I don't know. It's a tough choice, right? Somebody's got to go. No, nobody's going to make that choice. I think you throw over who's heaviest uh, because your boat floats better with the extra weight gone. And they'll sink faster so they won't scream as you at all. <laughs> you guys don't think about these things. Because you never know when you're going to end up on a lifeboat. Um, especially with seawater, sea levels rising, right? This becomes a much, much more likely reality. Uh, hey, who loves facial expressions? You all should, because this is how you know what other people are thinking, right? And if you're, and I know somebody's going to go like, what about the time somebody faked an emotion? on their face, they can only do that if they're really, really good, right? And I'm going to teach you a few tricks right here that are going to let you, like, get past that, right? So you can really know um, if somebody is, uh, is really feeling the way that you think they are. So, first, facial expressions seem to be innate. And there are two lines of evidence that seem to indicate this. One is a ton of cross-cultural studies, right? When you go to other cultures and you ask somebody, uh, hey, show me a face, and I've got an image here in a moment. Show me a face that uh, you make when you're happy. Guess what? It's the same face everybody else makes when they're happy, right? It's pretty much the same across the board, right? Very little variation. The second thing is uh, studies of folks who are congenitally blind, okay? Why is it important if they're congenitally blind because they're blind from birth? They've never seen someone smile. Guess what they do when they're happy? They smile, right? If you've never seen someone smile, how do you know to smile? Um, when you're happy. Well, that tells you it's innate, right? It's an innate behavior. It's a thing that happens. So their facial expressions, uh, they still make those. All right, so uh, here's a guy from New Guinea. They ask him, like, hey, make a face. Your friend's coming over and you're happy. This is obviously not a friend who owes him money and never pays, right? This is the, uh, the friend who never borrows money. Look how happy he is. Uh, here's the face you make when your kid has died. You can tell he's definitely sad, right? Uh, here's the face when you make when you make when you're about to fight somebody. I mean, if you saw somebody make that face at you, what would you do? Well, you would either run or get ready to fight, right, Kyle? Because that's the I'm going to fight you face. Probably laugh. 
Yeah, I think that's a quick way to lose a fight to that guy, because he looks pretty mad. <laughs> the fourth face here is uh, my favorite face, the dead pig face. Uh, this is the face someone makes when they see a dead pig on the road that's been there for a long time. I don't know if any of you have ever, I know, right? It's a, it's a disgusting face, right? You know, you're driving down the road or walking down the road or, I don't know, you wake up one day and somebody's put a dead cat in your mailbox. Um, and it smells, right? Because maybe you don't check your mails off your uh, It's been in there a little while. So, you kind of go, what is that face? It's the dead pig face, right? It's disgust. And all of these are great because you convey that emotion to somebody else, right? Let them know what you're thinking. Okay. Don't worry about this slide. This is a cool one, too. Uh, these are folks who are uh, blind. You guys remember when we talked about blind sight? These are folks who have damage to their um, primary visual cortex, so they're not able to have um, like visual input. So if you show them an object, let's say I don't see <coughs> blind, right? Uh, these are the same people who we had walked down the hall. We put trash cans in front of them, but they dodged the trash cans. You guys remember that? Uh, the other interesting thing they'll do is if you show them a picture of a face and you go, hey, what, what facial expression is this? I'll go, I, I, I don't see a face. I don't know what's going on. I don't see a face. Uh, and I go, take a guess anyway. Just take a guess, right? See what happens. Well, more often than chance, they'll guess correctly. Additionally, not only will they guess correctly what face they're seeing, they'll make that same face, right? How many of you, when you see someone smile at you, you smile in return? It's a pretty standard response. Everybody does that, right? Except for you weirdos. Uh, there, there are a few of them. Uh, and what if you see somebody frowning, right? And so what they would do are, are a fearful face, right? They would make the same face, uh, even though they couldn't consciously say they were seeing a face, they would make that same face uh, that they were seeing an image of. So again, that's some more evidence about, uh, you know, innate emotions and the way that they're processed. <coughs> so that's effective blinds to talk about. Uh, we should talk about laterality, too, which is kind of interesting. Uh, this is something you can do when you go home. You can go home and in front of your mirror, uh, or you can just do it you know, with like a, a camera, like a selfie. Uh, try to make yourself smile as big as you can, like a real smile, right? Because we'll tell you about fake smiles in a moment. And what you'll actually notice is probably the left side of your face is going to be more expressive than the other, right? So if you, um, if you smile, like the left side of your face is probably going to be smiling just a little bit higher. You'll have a higher angle of your cheek and your eyes are going to come down a little bit more on the sides. Uh, because more emotion is handled in the right hemisphere uh, than the left hemisphere. So that right, that left side of your face is going to be slightly more expressive. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So interestingly too, fake smiles, right? How many of you have ever fake smiled at someone? Yep, there you're doing it now. Uh, how many of you have ever thought someone was fake smiling at you? Right, it happens. The quickest way to tell is to actually look at their eyes. Right, if it's a real smile, what you'll see is their, uh, like the sides of their eyes will kind of pull down a little bit, right? And so you'll have some eye involvement if it's a fake smile. <laughs> uh, no eyes are involved. So there you go. Right, that's like school picture smile, right? <laughs> How many of you guys have a school picture like that that you've like thrown away? Yeah, your mom's got it somewhere, I promise. Passing it all the, out to all the people at her bridge club. I don't know. Is bridge club a thing? Casey, does that exist? <coughs> huh? Not old enough to know yet. All right. Give you time. They exist. Okay. The Red Hat Society, yeah. I don't know if anybody's mom's here is ready for the Red Hat Society. Uh, what's, the, what's the step down from that? Is there like a blue hat? I think a pink hat. Pink hats? How old do you have to be for that club? My best friend's in it. Her grandma's a red hat, and then she's a pink hat. So she's not pink. So I have no idea. It's aging fast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, there, there you go, right? So, pink hat application, CQ, should get you squared away. Uh, 
So, uh, yeah, so fake smiles uh, definitely in, uh, don't involve your eyes. This is why, how many of you have heard of method acting? Anybody familiar with method acting? Right, so this is a way of acting, of, of like sort of putting yourself in the mindset of someone who's going through the experience that you're supposed to be portraying, uh, sort of fictionally, right? Uh, and so there are some, some uh, you know, method actors who are you know, better than others, maybe. Uh, some maybe used to be better. I always worry about these folks who get a lot of Botox um, and, and what that does to their acting ability, right? You think about, because you, you have to be able to like control your face a little bit, right? And if it's always like, you can't get your eyes involved in that. And that's no good. Uh, so I think it's okay if you're an actor to get wrinkly because you can continue to convey emotion that way, right? So there you go. Uh, that's my, that would have been my advice to Dennis Quaid if he'd asked me, but he didn't. Uh, somebody laughed at that page. I don't know if you're a fan of Dragonheart or Rookie. It's only two Dennis Quaid movies I can think of off the top of my head. And I don't know why, uh, but there you go. So, uh, stay away from Botox so you can continue to um, convey emotions through your face. Right? That's good advice, right, Casey? Uh, we already talked about the amygdala. I'm not going to ask you too much about this. This is just weird. Um, yeah, there's like a whole conversation we could have here about, and we didn't spend enough time on the visual system to talk about, uh, you know, spatial frequency, right, Kyle? You remember all this. And, uh, it, you know, conveying emotions through the magnolar parvocellular layers of the LGN, right? And so I think for this class, we're going to skip it. Is that okay with you? Um, all right. Uh, here is um, someone who's had damage to their amygdala and they did some eye tracking on this. This is, if you normally look at someone while they're talking to you, you're trying to interact with them, you spend a lot of time looking at the eyes, a little bit coming down into the mouth, right? And again, it's because you're checking for those fake smiles, right? You want to make sure eyes are getting involved. Uh, if you've had damage to your amygdala, what you see here, less, if not any time, focused on the eyes and focusing more on the mouth, right? The mouth will trick you. Uh, that's just that's just a word of the wise. The reason for that is uh, people say things and their mouth moves, right? And when their mouth moves while you're saying things, then can you see what emotion they're trying to express? It becomes a little more difficult. Your eyes, though, are going to kind of stay the same, right? And if you've got squinty eyes, maybe obviously because somebody's angry, even though their mouth is moving. That's why you should always look people in the eye. It's also a little bit intimidating. Oh, yeah, we should talk about this. These are two important things. Uh, direction of gaze and disgust. Okay? These go hand in hand. They're really important. First, we need to think about these neurons that are sensitive to direction of gaze, right? So, uh, you've got neurons in your brain, right? And this is in the, what we call the superior, tem superior temporal sulcus, right? Not a big deal. Basically, they get excited, uh, and there are some that get excited depending on which way you're looking, right? In this particular case, these cells get excited when someone's looking up, right? And not just is the face tilted up, but notice the eyes are tilted up as well, right? Here, head is up, but the eyes are kind of coming out. Here, the head is level, but the eyes again are pointed up, right? So that's kind of interesting. Uh, and then here's a side view as well, uh, where the head and the eyes are both tilted up, okay? Why is it important to know where other people are looking? Well, uh, other people are looking in that direction for a reason, and that reason could be something important to your survival, right? And if you're able to go, hmm, that guy's looking up, maybe I should take a quick peek up and see what's there, right? And I know, how many of you have had like social psychology classes? Nobody? Great, oh, sorry. Uh, did they make you go outside and like look up up to see if people would look up, right? They're like, oh, this is because, no. It's yeah, simply, you left? Yeah, because they were laughing at people, and I was like, I'm not going to Yeah, I don't blame you. It was a waste of time. <laughs> but why did they tell you people were looking? Oh, it's like a whole group of people. Everybody's going to look up, peer pressure or whatever. I don't know, right? No, you got neurons in your brain that, like, when somebody looks up, you're like, I wonder if there's, like, a big bird coming down to eat me. I better check, right? It's just survival, right? And it just happens. You can do it with monkeys. Monkeys, uh, actually, again, this study was done in monkeys, right? So 
it's kind of hard to say, like, human social constructs are going to apply to monkeys. I mean, monkeys have social constructs, right, whatever. Uh, but you just got stuff in your brain that goes, that guy's looking over there, and uh, he looks a little worried. Maybe something over there is dangerous. I should check that out and see if I need to avoid it as well. Is that something? worry about this too much <clears throat> but this is interesting uh, one of the most important things for you to avoid in life are things that are disgusting that's a true story right uh, so Paris what are disgusting things well things that make you sick are disgusting right and so there was a study a few years ago I think it was conducted through the BBC uh, they gave people these images and they had to rate how disgusting they were right and what's really interesting is these images are largely similar. Like, if you look at this first set of images, it's basically the same image, right? It's a guy sticking his finger in some jello, okay? But one is clearly more disgusting than the other. This is clearly more disgusting. Why is that? How many of you have ever seen this color come out of somebody's body? How many of you have ever seen this color come out of somebody's body? Not as often, right? This color can make you sick. This color is like weird melted jelly, right? It's nothing to worry about, so it's not as disgusting. You move down a row, look at this guy. Okay, so obviously some people thought he was disgusting, um, you know, because they, they rated him as such. Uh, I feel a little sorry for him. He's, he's more disgusting than a subway, an empty subway, so I said, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> I know, right? What do you think about this? So, but what about this guy? Far more disgusting, right? What's he look like? He's sweaty. His face is red. You know, sweaty people with red faces, you know what they have? Diseases. <laughs> right? Because what is, what is, um, what if you have a fever? Right? You're going to be sweaty. You're going to be flushed, right? That's a sign of illness. Okay? So avoid uh, sweaty, flushed, red-faced people. Right? And you'll live a little longer. Uh, what about the subway, though? Let's think about the subway. Look at how much more disgusting that subway is with all those people in it. Do you know what people have? They have germs, right? And you rub up against them, and you get their germs, right? And sometimes you might think, well, that sounds like fun, uh, but it does until you're, like, in the hospital. Here is basically a repeat of that first image, right? Okay. We've got some bodily fluid thing and then something that's not. You keep moving down. Uh, what about which one's more disgusting here? Now, both of these are very disgusting. You notice the ratings, right? It's like a 3.6. Um, but again, this looks far more disgusting, right? And uh, oh, what about these guys? Those aren't disgusting at all, are they? Uh, but if you look at, uh, I like this, this guy down here at the bottom. And again, what's important is none of these are really associated with a disease. But these guys are on this side, right? And you should avoid things that, uh, that carry diseases, right? Okay. And so, if you were to see some of these things, what if you saw that on the floor? What face do you make? It's the dead pig face. <clears throat> and you, you look at it, right? And then everybody who comes in knows, there's something gross right there. What am I going to do? I'm going to go the other way, right? So what if Mary comes over here? Uh, and by the door, and she goes, how many of you are going to go that way instead? Right? Like almost everybody. And that's, man, that's evolution of work right there. That's what's kept you alive, avoiding things that are gross. Uh, what about facial paresis? Right? There are two kinds of facial paresis. Uh, there's facial paresis that is what we call volitional. Right? And then there's emotional. And this is just telling you that emotional, like facial expressions are handled by different circuits, right? So you can have brain damage that prevents you from voluntarily making a facial expression, right? And so they'll say to you, okay, uh, show me your teeth. And you go, you can't do it. But then they tell you a funny joke, and guess what you do? You laugh and you smile and your teeth show, right? Uh, the reverse of that is uh, they say, hey, show me your teeth. And you go, ah, oh, here you go, right? And you can show your teeth, and then they tell you a funny joke, and you go, mm -hmm, yeah, that, that was funny. Uh, and you really think it was funny, but you're not able to, to express that, right? And so voluntary or volitional and those sort of automatic or emotional facial expressions are handled in two different circuits, right? Two different brain circuits handle that. 
and so you can have damage to either one. Again, that tells you the importance of facial expressions, right, in conveying those emotions to other people. You should try this. Uh, I think everyone for the next two weeks should walk around with this facial expression. No matter the situation. Somebody walks up to you and gives you $100. <laughs> Somebody jabs you with a shank. <laughs> Same face. See what happens. People will think you're weird. Right, Casey? Mm -hmm. Have you ever done that and just walk around? Blank face. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's hard to do it. I do it here too. I try to keep people from talking to me. It's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty effective. Oh, we already talked about artificially producing um, realistic facial expressions. Remember the eyes. Watch out for those people who you think you're friends with, right? That might live near you. And smile and don't involve their eyes. Hypocrites. You're allowed to kick them, Bethany. As long as you don't leave a mark, right? Huh? Right. So use the soap in the tube side. That's a good trick. I can't believe more people don't know about that. I thought that was just like a regular thing everybody knew. No? <laughs> in prison. I went to prison once. Um, I went there as a, I went to visit, like a, as, a, as like a class field trip. I went to a federal prison. Yeah. It was really quiet, um, which, was, which was a little sort of surprising. Uh, and then the folks there were like, like, everybody who works there has to be willing and able to shoot someone if they try to climb a wall. Well, that's intense. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, there was just, and this was a prison, I think, where they, they put people who weren't, um, there were a lot of older men there at that particular prison, right? And so they, they transferred them there as they'd been other places and they were like not causing problems. So it was just like a bunch of old guys like shooting pool wearing headphones. Because uh, they had like TVs playing and you couldn't hear anything and everybody just had their headphones on, just like minding their own business. Uh, they made furniture there. Right? So they made these guys like saws and screwdrivers too. So they made furniture. The, the, the prisoners in West Virginia not make furniture? So this was in the state of Kentucky and like they make uh, like all of the like state schools, like the dorm furniture is all made by prisoners. Yeah. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah, they make office furniture for a lot of the state offices and stuff. So, so you Huh? You can't take your friend there? Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't think they give them chainsaws. I think they're manual. I think he's okay with like the handsaw. And so he's fine. Yeah, just, and there's, there wasn't even a blade on it. There wasn't even like a chain on it. It was just like, you know, like, because I mean, if you're going to be like jumping out at people, you're not going to put a chain on it unless you're really trying to hurt somebody. And they weren't because they wanted us to tell everybody else, like, hey, we had a great time. Come back and pay $8 to go through it or whatever it costs. I don't even know. Right? Anybody own or operate a cornfield maze? No. What are you guys doing? It should all chip in together, buy a plot of land, grow some corn on it, jump out with chainsaws. Class project. Oh, and then there again, left side of the face is going to be much more uh, expressive. Don't worry about this. I don't really want to tell you about this, but I, but I have to because it's on this slide. Uh, there was some guy, William James. Have you ever heard of William James? They have to have heard of William James, right? Did you not teach them about William James? I did. Okay. So William James, what's he known as? I think the father of psychology, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had a brother. You guys know his brother? His brother Henry? Nobody knows Henry James? You guys are going down real fast. You guys know Portrait of a Lady? You guys are lucky this is not an English lit class, right? Because what I would do is I would throw copies of Portrait of a Lady at you, and I'm going to tell you it's a thick book. It's going to hurt. <laughs> and I'm not even going to be able to hit you in the back, Kyle. I can get some distance on it, right? Uh, so William James had this idea. Uh, I mean, I mean, when was he doing his best work? Like the 1800s, right? This guy was a long time ago. He wrote a book. He's called The Father of Psychology, Brandon. He wrote a book. Guess what it was called? 
It was called psychology. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. It's like, I think it was called this one psychology. It might have been called Principles of Psychology. Actually, was that the title? You don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Right? Yeah, I didn't. Either. I read one chapter about instincts, the collecting instinct. Right? He thought collecting was an instinct. So, like, you were allowed to collect things because it was an instinct. I don't know. It's kind of interesting. It is principles. It is principles. Yeah. Yeah. He thought there were like hundreds of instincts, right, that humans have. It's kind of interesting. That is. He had this idea that basically, uh, instead of something happening, and then like, you having an, an emotion and then creating a behavior, it's like you had a behavior and then your feedback from that behavior is, is, is what made you feel that emotion, right? And so sort of the classic, sort of like, oh, here's the best example we have of this theory is like the pencil on the lip, you guys know that one? Like where you put a pencil on your lip and you try to like hold it there and you make this face for a long time and you're like, oh, I'm getting angry. Are you getting angry because like some idiot's making you hold a pencil on your lip? I mean, that's why I'd be angry. Uh, or is it because you're like making an angry face, right? And then you start to feel angry, right? So it's like, well, whatever. I'm only telling you about that because I think somebody else will tell you about it. Don't waste your time on it. Right? I, very, there are like, a handful of examples where you could actually think this might work, and most of the time there's probably something else going on. Uh, what about imitation in infants? You gotta watch those little things. They'll just do whatever you tell them to, uh, except for when you want them to. And then they'll do whatever it is they want. So there you go. Who remembers those motor neurons, or those mirror neurons? You guys remember those? Yeah, so those guys are, are uh, can be involved in this imitation uh, process as well, right? When you see somebody else do something, uh, those same neurons will get excited, and then you, uh, when you perform that action, uh, the same you know, neurons get excited again. All right, questions, comments, concerns about emotion? Great.